Welcome to today's ODI event. It's really wonderful to see so many people here, and I know there are also a lot of other people participating online. So um, there's obviously a huge amount of interest in this topic, which is great. Thank you all for taking the time to come. A few practicalities I've been told to start with. The toilets are down past reception on the left. Um, there's no fire drill expected, so if the fire alarm goes off, please leave by reception where you came in and stand out the front. Um, if anybody's tweeting, I think you've got the Twitter hashtag up there. Um, do, t we do tweet as much as you can, that would be great. Um, and ODI will pick it up later on. Um, so first, let me introduce myself and my panel of distinguished speakers. My name is Nikki van der Gaag. Um, I started two weeks ago as Oxfam's Director of Gender Justice and Women's Rights. So I'm new to this role. But prior to that, I was a, an independent consultant, um, originally working a lot around girls' issues and um, authoring some of PLAN's State of the World's girls' reports, including one on boys and one on um, structural changes to power that needed to happen for girls to kind of be part of the debate. So I've been really interested in watching how the kind of girls' debate has been going forward, and then gradually how people have been questioning some of the ways that, that, people have, that work, girls are being worked with, and we're going to look at that in much more detail today. So I'm really looking forward to this debate. I hope it kicks off a discussion that we continue a lot further. Um, and I'm going to introduce some of the um, panel. So the event is hosted by the Secure Livelihoods Research Consortium, which is based in a number of different places, including ODI. It's a six-year global research program funded by UK aid from the government here, by Irish aid, and by the European Commission. And it's exploring livelihoods, basic services, and social protection in conflict-affected situations. So the interest in the area stems from work being done under the Sierra Leone country program, which you will hear about today, looking at efforts to reduce teenage pregnancy in the wake of Ebola. So why, why is ODI convening this discussion? Uh, with two, I guess there are two, two kind of um, questions there. So beyond investing in girls, what we mean, and are girls the answer? I think somebody tweeted already, are girls the answer? Yes, but. So I think we're looking at the but bit, as well as are girls the answer. Um, there's, we all know that there are a whole array of initiatives that have emerged in the last five years or so seeking to empower girls. And that's in response to both concerns about inequitable progress and belief in the social dividends of investing in girls and women. And I think it's interesting that the word investing comes up such a lot. So from the Nike and Diffid girl funded Girl Hub to United Nations Foundation's Girl Initiative um, to G20 Girls Summit, there's, there's a whole list of programs that work both on the ground and that work on advocacy on girls. So the idea is that girls are the best catalysts for change, but it's also problematic because they're being posited as the most vulnerable group as well. So difficult to be the most vulnerable group and being able to save the world. And I think that's what we're going to explore a bit more today. It assumes that girls have the power to make structural changes. and. I think when, when we actually look at how, what, how that pans out on the ground and the kinds of programs that we're going to be talking about, there are quite a lot of questions around it. So this, this event takes a step back from the rush to invest in girls. It's not saying we don't want to invest in girls. We do. But how do we, how we do it and how can we do it better and how can we do it so we're actually looking at structural changes as well. So I'm delighted to have the panel here today. I hope there are going to be lots of really interesting questions as well afterwards. So I'll first introduce Nisa Denny, who is the Sierra Leone Country Manager for the Secure Livelihoods um, Research Consortium. She's also a research associate in politics and governance program here at ODI. Her interests focus on the relationship between security and development, access to justice, post-conflict peace building, and the need to better account for local governance practices. Nisa also has a background in using political economy analysis to inform donor programming. And she's going to talk about the Sierra Leone program and with teenage, on teenage pregnancy. 
Shanila Kojamuji is the postdoctorate research scholar at the program, very long title, this program in democracy, citizenship, and constitutionalism at the Department of Gender, Sexuality, and Women's Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. That's quite a mouthful. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Her research interests include examining discourses on gender in education and their entanglement with practices of power, a word that's often left out of the girls' discourse, I think. She's written extensively about the convergence of the figure of the girl in transnational development regimes and pursues an active public scholarship agenda with opinion pieces and essays appearing in the New York Times, Washington Post and the Huffington Post. And we have Natko Jerez, who um, I met a long time ago in uh, Zagreb where he was um, director of Status M, which was a wonderful um, NGO working with young men on creating more equitable Croatian society by deconstructing the rigid norms of masculinity. He's now currently program officer at Promundo, where he both focuses both on research related to men and gender equality and on men's engagement in post-conflict and high-violence settings. He coordinates projects related to violence prevention, including Young Men's Clubs Against Violence in Kinshasa and the International Men and Gender Equality Survey images in the Middle East, North Africa and Afghanistan. I'm sure he'll tell you a bit more about that as well. He also manages the peace-building initiative with the United, in sorry, United States Institute of Peace in Afghanistan. And finally, last but not least, <laughs> Sinead Walsh is the former ambassador, former Irish ambassador to Sierra Leone and has over 20 years of development experience in the field. She's currently visiting senior fellow at the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative and visiting scholar at the Harvard University Medical School where she's working on a book on Ebola sounds really interesting in our earlier discussions. So welcome, everybody. Um, just to remind you all, we'll we will have a Q&A at the end that will involve people from all over the world who've signed up. And they're using a chat room, so I hope I'm going to be able to manage your questions and the questions that are coming up here on the iPad. OK, so Lisa, I'd like you to begin, please. Thanks very much. Well, thank you all very much for coming. Um, it's great that we've got such a group of people here to have a, a good discussion. Um, what I'm going to talk through today is the research that, that we've been doing under the SLRC in Sierra Leone um, in the last year of our engagement, um, which is focused on uh, efforts to reduce teenage pregnancy. So what I'll talk about is based on a report that we published in May, copies of which are here, called Change the Context, Not the Girls, Improving Efforts to Reduce Teenage Pregnancy in Sierra Leone. And before I get into it, I just want to uh, introduce some of the other members of the research team. So Rachel Gordon uh, from the Fine Science Centre at Tufts University um, has been involved across the research. We also worked with um, Dr. Aisha Ibrahim at Fora Bay College, University of Sierra Leone, and two of her MA students, Precious Levy and Aminata Kamara, who um, uh, authored the final report with us. So we're up and going. Okay. So where are we starting from? Just to give you a sense, Sierra Leone has one of the highest rates of teenage pregnancy in the world. So the majority of teenagers are sexually active, but less than half of them are using um, contraception. 40% of women aged between 20 and 24 have had their first child before age 18. And we know then, of course, about the health and education consequences of, of teenage pregnancy, both for the girls affected as well as for their children. So this situation has then been augmented by the Ebola crisis. So during our research, all of the communities we went to, people, people said that uh, teenage pregnancy had increased during the outbreak. And that's now been supported by um, a study done by UNFPA that found 18,119 girls got pregnant during the Ebola outbreak. Now, it's a little bit tricky because we don't have quite such a neat number um, as, as to what was going on beforehand. But nonetheless, there's a, a widely accepted, um, it's widely accepted that there has been an increase. What's less known is, is exactly why that increase has occurred. And there's a few different reasons, and there's ongoing research um, that, that's coming out around that. So some people say that, that it's increased because schools were closed for 10 months, uh, girls and boys were idle, and this led to, to greater, um, uh, greater teenage pregnancy. So one thing we heard a lot in the communities we visited was uh, an idle mind is the devil's workshop. And that was probably one of the most prevalent um, reasons we heard from adults in particular. Um, others argue that transactional, cre uh, transactional sex has increased due to more acute poverty and, and difficulty in accessing resources, and that's probably the, the category that we heard most about from teenage girls and teenage boys themselves. And then others point to increase in sexual violence and rape, um, uh, with, with girls more vulnerable being left at home alone uh, when they were out of school or being sent away to live with, with friends and family in, in um, unaffected areas. So we don't ha quite have a clear picture on this, and, and debates around that are still, um, still ongoing. 
So just to give you a sense of, of what we've done, so we started this project uh, late last year. Um, the initial trip um, was a sort of scoping visit, um, talking to donors, national and international NGOs and different parts of government in Freetown to try and get a sense of the spectrum of interventions that, that people are, are mm -hmm. using to try and address this problem. We then followed that up in January of this year with um, community visits in six districts in Sierra Leone to look at how these interventions were playing out on the ground, see what some of the gaps are um, and what could be done differently. So there's a range of people we interviewed um, listed up there and we, we then did focus groups in each of the communities we went to with teenage girls, uh, separate from teenage boys, as well as with parents of teenagers. And the age bracket that we're using here was, was 13 to, to 18 years old. So what's been done? There's a range of interventions. The, the, those that are listed here, I mean, the top two are, are the ones that we found most prevalent. So first was adolescent and girl-friendly spaces. So these were set up variously in, in schools, in health clinics, as well as in communities. Um, uh, and, and they sort of provided a space for girls to, to come and, and be safe, as well as a, a forum for providing information. Connected to that was then outreach and awareness raising. This really focused on providing information um, to girls as well as to others in the community um, with the intention of sort of trying to shift attitude and, and behaviours. Life skills training was also very common and sort of fits under uh, the two other modalities in some ways. Um, so there were various providers of this with lots of different messages, um, but a lot of these focused around, in terms of what we were interested in, avoiding pregnancy, um, STIs, HIV AIDS, violence against women, um, and then a sort of broader set of, of life skills. We found much less in the way of programming around the access to justice um, part of, of, of the problem. Um, so there were some organisations working to um, provide legal aid and, and support to, to women and girls who've been affected by sexual violence and rape, um, but that was a much smaller component and, and not necessarily quite as connected to discussions around teenage pregnancy. And we also um, came across a, a relatively limited set of programs working with men and boys. Um, the exception to this, which the photo here is from, is from a group called Fine Sierra Leone who run husband schools, um, which we can talk about in a bit more detail um, in discussion if that's of interest. And then finally, there's also some support to central government institutions, primarily by way of budget support, secondments and whatnot to the, to the Ministry of Health where the Teenage Pregnancy Secretariat is, is housed. So, these programs, of course, face a number of um, general implementation challenges, and that was especially true during Ebola. So, for instance, you know, it was hard for girls to access some of the friendly spaces and, and access contraception during that time. Um, it's also not always clear that the friendly spaces were necessarily um, using appropriately tailored activities to attract um, girls to, to their spaces. So we came across, you know, places where board games were still in their wrapping paper, televisions were provided to places that didn't have electricity, these sorts of, um, these sorts of challenges. But we also found some, some bigger conceptual challenges underlying um, these programs, and it's those that we really wanted to, to focus on and discuss um, with you guys today. So there's five that I'm going to talk through briefly. Um, the first was the focus overwhelmingly um, on girls. So what we found is that the majority of programming focuses on changing girls' behaviour, <coughs> making it girls' responsibility to abstain from sex, to avoid pregnancy, to use contraception, to go back to school or to stay in school, and so on. But girls are often the ones with the least power in these situations. They're not simply choosing to engage in unsafe sex as one of, you know, myriad options available to them. Rather, girls face incredibly constrained options, are routinely propositioned and harassed by men, are expected to look after themselves and yet have very few livelihood opportunities to do so. And as a result, they can end up engaging in things like transactional sex. So focusing support overwhelmingly on girls assumes that girls are simply able to make better decisions when it's actually the context that they're living in that fundamentally shapes their ability to, to make decisions and, and to act in certain ways. So we found, you know, surprisingly absent from a lot of this work, a lot of this programming, um, an engagement with men and boys, um, as well as an engagement with, say, um, parents, religious and customary leaders um, that, that really are fundamental to shaping the wider environment that's influencing girls' behaviour and decisions and, and is resulting in, in high rates of teenage pregnancy. The second uh, thing we came across was, was the different types of sex that girls are having. Um, and here we thought it was interesting that programmes tend to treat teenage pregnancy as a, as a homogenous category and they don't really differentiate between the different kinds of sexual experiences that are leading to, to girls uh, getting pregnant. So this includes peer-to-peer -peer sex, um, rape and transactional sex. And these categories also overlap. Um, so we 
found that um, girls who were engaging in transactional sex talked about being more likely to, to then start engaging in, in peer to peer sex. So we felt that programs should really try and tailor their, their activities to address the different ways in which girls are getting pregnant. And you know, programs that are focusing on, for instance, trying to make peer-to-peer -peer sex safer should necessarily look different than to programs that are you know, trying to prevent girls from engaging in transactional sex. And again, of course, programs that are working on um, preventing sexual violence, for instance. Third, knowledge doesn't always lead to behavior change. So a lot of programming is focused around providing knowledge, um, both to girls but also to, to parents and others in the community, in order to lead to better decisions and, and sort of improved behaviour. But again, this can assume that girls have more power than they, than they do in reality. So for instance, in relation to, to contraceptives, um, girls might know that they exist, know how to access them, understand why they're important. Um, but, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to use them in practice. There's a whole range of other factors related to access, cost, peer pressure, abuse by partners also, and, and so on that, that can sort of prevent that ability for knowledge to translate into practice. And this isn't really surprising. I mean, we often see that people act and make decisions in ways that are not purely based on, on their knowledge and what they know. And this came out quite clearly in Sierra Leone during the Ebola outbreak. There's been some um, knowledge, attitude and practice studies done that show that people actually had quite good knowledge of the symptoms um, that, that sort of manifested when you get Ebola. And yet, despite that knowledge, they didn't necessarily follow the referral pathways that, that were set up. And again, this goes to show that you know, knowledge is only one factor that influences people's decisions and, and behavior. So providing girls with knowledge, while of course an important first step, won't necessarily lead them to make better decisions because their decisions are affected by, by a wider range of, of variables. So we argue that, that programming should be working to change that wider environment in which girls are being incentivized to make particular decisions to enable them to make better ones. The fourth thing um, that we, we thought was important was that the messenger matters in a lot of these, these girl-friendly and child-friendly spaces. So the people running a lot of these programs are often from the, the local community, um, which is very important, of course, because it empowers local community leaders, makes the change process more locally led, and so on. But it also means that those people have the same cultural biases, the same range of views as, as the rest of society. And so we came across um, health clinic staff who didn't believe in giving contraceptives to, to sexually active girls who were under a certain age, um, who didn't believe in um, referring them to, to safe abortions, which is particularly controversial in Sierra Leone, of course, because abortion is, is still illegal. Um, we also came across girls club leaders who didn't want to talk about contraception with girls at school because they felt that girls at school shouldn't be having sex, that talked about the fact that um, you could avoid being raped by dressing conservatively and, and so on. So this can mean that the messages being promoted through these interventions uh, sort of get muddled, I guess, on the way from you know, what we intend to start to, to tell people to what ends up being, um, being received at the end. And so I think there's a need to engage with some of these um, contrasting views early on to make sure that those, those sorts of influences don't end up undermining the messages that are meant to be getting through. And the final point then is the, the missing piece that we saw on, on justice and the socio-cultural aspects of, of teenage pregnancy. So the majority of programming is focused on the health and education aspects of the problem, which are obviously very important, but we felt that the justice and, and socio-cultural aspects sort of fall out um, a little bit. So we heard a lot of people in Sierra Leone talking about the, um, the Sexual Offences Act, which, which notes that it's illegal um, to have sex with somebody who's under 18. And actually knowledge of that was, was pretty impressive, even amongst um, the, the teenage boys and girls that we spoke with. But people sort of said, but, th but this isn't enforced in practice. And we had one teenage boy actually say, oh, maybe this is a new law because we've never seen anybody you know, actually prosecuted under this. So maybe they haven't rolled it out yet. Um, we also, you know, of course, heard about cases of rape being settled, um, girls being involved in underage marriage, um, which is connected then, of course, with, with early pregnancy, and it is in turn connected to initiation practices and female circumcision and so on. So we felt that, that support to some of these aspects um, were missing a little bit um, and that there could be much more investment in that area. And just by way of example, there was, um, in Sierra Leone, you have the, the family support units, which are police stations set up to deal with crimes involving women and children. Um, there's 68 of these uh, nationwide. And in 2015, their budget was doubled um, to $500 per quarter for all 68 family support units across the country. Um, which just really speaks to the massive underinvestment in, in, in this um, aspect. So finally, I mean, I just wanted to, to reinforce, I mean, much of what we heard from, from girls as well as from men and boys comes back to this transactional um, nature of sex. 
A lot of that, of course, has to do with poverty and girls' um, constrained circumstances, but it also has a lot to do with gender roles um, and the social acceptance of behaviours that allow men to demand sex as payment. Um, and we, we really heard very little questioning of that norm, um, particularly from men. So a lot of people say, you know, oh, it's poverty that's leading to, to teenage pregnancy. But it's not poverty, of course, that's actually impregnating girls. And I think the attitude that it's acceptable for men and boys to use girls in this way is something that needs to be, um, to be more fundamentally challenged. So for us, and, and the idea of this panel, um, was to reflect on this sort of turn to girls and push for greater engagement, not just with girls themselves, um, but also with others who are sort of shaping their lives and the wider um, circumstances that they find themselves in. Thanks. Thank you, Lisa. Really interesting research, and um, I'm sure we'll have some questions about that in a little while. So, Shanila, I'll move on to you. Thank you. I'll begin by thanking ODI for um, designing this session, which uh, is going to be provocative and also quite generative. Um, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about my positionality before um, going through my presentation. Um, I come to this dialogue from a cultural studies and transnational feminist perspective, which means that I uh, look at the kinds of knowledges about populations in the global south, about girls in the global south, that are created in and through dominant discourses on girls' education and girls' empowerment. Um, and so the idea is that these knowledges are not apolitical. There is a politics of representation. There are particular kinds of ideas that we um, get about girls in the global south, which have consequences, because they have consequences for development practice and development policy making. And so I'm going to, um, to, to uh, inaugurate my few slides by foregrounding those ideas. Um, since we only have 10 minutes, I'm going to talk about a couple of ideas. Um, and then if we have time, perhaps in Q&A, I can talk a little bit about my work in Pakistan. But right now, I'll stay um, at the level of the politics of representation. Um, so a very cursory um, glance at some of the materials, narratives, and visualities that are produced um, in girls' education and girls' empowerment campaigns shows us that this discourse has a race and a class. This discourse is often about black and brown girls, and we're talking about people who are living in poverty or low income, um, in low income circumstances. However, at the same time, what is curious is that these very differences are then elided when we actually talk about solutions. And so what we then observe is that the very differences of social class, um, of sexuality, of nation, of religion that often structure the lives of girls in the global south um, are erased and we, are, we end up with a figure of this homogenous empowered girl who is supposed to have a particular life script. She's expected to go to school, enter waged work, um, perhaps um, enact particular consumption and entrepreneurial characteristics. She's expected to delay marriage, uh, delay child rearing, and then partake in contributing to the national GDP. So we we have this imagination around a particular empowered girl, around a good life um, that we are then left with. Um, this also happens if we look at a range of different um, narratives of public intellectuals and visualities, right? So I just posted um, a couple of photos here. More details are in my academic article. But if you look here, what you will see is that um, that there's systematicity across the girls. The ways in which we encounter girls um, essentially portrays that if you know one, you know everyone else, right? If I actually can figure out how to resolve one person's issues, I can create similar interventions and policies to address all girls in the, in the global south. And for me, this is a paradox because we actually began with foregrounding race and social class um, of these girls. So this discourse has some contradictions um, within it. What is more problematic, however, is that um, if we don't attend to race and class and nation and religion, which actually structure um, the lives of girls, we're actually erasing some of the analysis that can actually help us create better policy. And so if we are to think about this, um, we are, um, like um, Lisa here said, um, we're creating this narrative of responsibilizing the girls. Um, here, in a very stark um, format, you will see that the girl appears as a superhero. She has a book and a pen, and she's confronting poverty all by herself. If this is our starting moment, 
that there is poverty and girls can actually address it, then what happened to histories of colonization? What happened to current practices of global capital that extract labor from girls in the global south? What happens to state corruption? What happens to global north and our consumption patterns here um, that actually are, are intricately linked with creation of poverty elsewhere? Right. So um, if our starting point is this, um, then we are erasing deeper analysis and deeper histories, um, which becomes problematic. Um, the second point um, that I also wanted to make is that um, much of my work is actually historical. So um, I look at how women and girls' education discourses uh, since 1857 um, in colonial India and now in post-colonial Pakistan um, have been taken up as a social space in and through which colonial officers, national reformers, even Muslim women themselves, they talked about creating an imagined future. So the idea that girls' education um, is something that we should be investing in, and we all seem to have converged on this in the current moment. This is actually just the current episode in a long history where there have been time and moments where we have focused on women's education as a discourse in and through which affect different kinds of uh, social projects. So um, in the context of colonial India, for national reformers, it was around um, re-accessing respectability. It was around creating um, a, a Muslim community that practiced proper Islam. Um, in terms of colonial, uh, the colonizers, is what it was in some ways entering into the Zanana homosocial spaces in colonial India. So what I'm trying to point out is that women's education has often functioned um, as a discourse in and through which we are talking about actually other social projects as well. Um, and then finally, um, it's, this is linked to um, uh, Lisa, but also more so the next presenter. Um, when we um, when we erase histories, when we do, or not when we don't engage in deeper analysis, um, it also becomes easy to miss focus on other hindrances, right? So, um, in the girls' education, girls' empowerment discourse, especially um, in the representations that circulate around Malala in Pakistan, for example, um, these are Anglophone media, by the way. Um, we observe this figure of the Muslim man, um, the, the violence of Islam ideas that brown and black men somehow uh, don't want um, women in their communities to get empowered, um, do not want them to get an education. And of course, we have to place the development discourse within a broader discourse, right? We're saturated with these images of brown and black men. We are saturated with particular understandings about Islam. And so if we contextualize this discourse within that discourse, it becomes easy to then create these kinds of imaginations around a whole host of diverse men, a whole host of communities. And so um, it, then becomes, it then becomes possible to then demonize work, um, which makes it harder for people here to get funding for working on men and masculinities and development too, right? So all of these are, um, these are, these dialogues, these are intricately connected. But um, I wanted to point to the politics of how our analysis then becomes focused on uh, particular ideas that hinder girls' education and not the broader histories. Um, so I'll conclude by saying that um, taking up a cultural or a critical studies approach to thinking about um, figures of convergence, figures in international development, can help us think about the ideological and cultural work that narratives and textualities do, right? The narratives and visuals of these campaigns do. Um, and often, um, we, we're, not, we're not actually thinking about those because we're, all of us, the practitioners, the policymakers, have good intentions when we're going the field. Um, but often at the same time, um, these similar images have, um, they might create further marginalizations at the level of thought and future action than we might realize in the present. Thank you. Thank you very much. Really interesting historical and broader analysis that kind of get, get under, underpins what Lisa was saying. So thank Thanks. you. Natkin. All right. Uh, so it's, it's, it's really in interesting. 
and got me also to think a little bit how to remodulate my presentation as well. Um, so I work in Promundo. Promundo is an organization working in four offices in Brazil, uh, DRC, Portugal, and the US. We are about 50 uh, men and women uh, working on engaging men in prevention of gender-based violence and the constructing the negative uh, aspects of masculinity around the world. Uh, we are primarily a research organization trying to provide uh, concrete, relevant, local evidence on how to uh, approach and engage men in uh, deconstructive, deconstructive negative forms of masculinity. As an example, uh, we've conducted international men and gender equality survey in more than 30, 35 countries around the world, and it's the biggest research of its kind on understanding the norms, behaviors, attitudes of both men and women uh, toward masculinity uh, around the world. In each of the countries where it was done, it was adapted, and it's served to inform concrete local programming and practices and advocacy in order to achieve uh, high uh, relevance for again the local uh, for the local context uh, so we don't come from a normative position saying that there is a one unique model of masculinity which then needs to be uh, incorporated in the social tissue of every single uh, society and uh, coming from a stand that men are bad and that we are here to change the men so that they all become this uniformed positive men that live one certain positive masculinity but rather try to through research understand uh, how men live their lives, what are their realities, what is their context, and then build on the positive practices, understanding that there are men who, there are behaviors, there are norms which are positive and build on those, and then tackle and uh, try to transform the negative ones, uh, building partnership with men, not looking at men as uh, uh, enemies, uh, but not working with men in silk gloves, but ra rather working with men as partners, uh, and not hiding the accountability of men uh, for the violence uh, that they are doing. Uh, in order to approach men, we need to work on by using pro uh, programs uh, which will invite men and uh, which will give a message to the men that struggle for gender equality is their own thing it, that is not something which is uh, disconnected from their life which is a uh, something which is women's uh, only issue but rather that is very much relevant for their own lives and uh, in order to do that we have to find language we have to find an approach which will invite men uh, instead of uh, make them feel that they are the enemies, that they are uh, the ones that are always necessarily uh, behaving wrong and that they need to live up to a certain standard that in, in the beginning of the approach they don't already uh, live up to. Uh, one of the strategy that we use is, for instance, the Men Care campaign. It's a global fatherhood campaign working on, with men on active, engaged, uh, antenatal and early childhood care, where we work with men on the issues of gender uh, <laughs> equality and social justice, uh, but by engaging them uh, in a area in a team which is very interesting for them and which they feel as their own uh, which is caring uh, through that talking about the ho household relations gender relations talking about violence uh, but also talking about issues like uh, models of masculinity which are caring instead of violent changing the uh, dynamics between men and women where men need to subordinate women and men make, need to make decisions into uh, working with men into understanding that uh, sharing decision making and uh, uh, sharing power working together will benefit them and will benefit people around them ben will benefit children uh, women uh, and the communities in <coughs> whole so in our work, we use the gender transformative approach, uh, where we uh, not only try to mitigate the effects of the gender inequality and the patriarchal system, but rather engage with men in critically reflecting on the social norms on masculinity and motivate them to uh, be the 
agents of the change of the same uh, constructs, uh, get them to be uh, uh, engaged and get them to uh, transform what is very often presented as a model of a society that needs to function and it's the only way that the society needs to function, but rather uh, and getting men to understand that everything is in their hands, that uh, changing negative aspects of masculinity will benefit both them and people around them. Uh, very often men are uh, pushed into living their lives by not asking for help, by being violent, uh, but by not showing care, not showing emotions. We want to show them the benefits of uh, rethinking that model of masculinity, but also uh, get them to be responsible for the violence that them and other men do, and uh, to change the society, understanding that social norms are a thing which is in the present and can be changed uh, if uh, there is a, uh, enough energy put, enough energy and resources put in order to change the social norms. Uh, when I say that, it's crucial also to have in mind and what we try to incorporate in our work is that working with men again is not enough. We can work with a group of young uh, men or a group with men for three months, get them to be very motiv for, motivated for the change, get them to really want to uh, live their lives as men differently, but then they go back to their communities and then they push back into the rigid hegemonic uh, uh, boxes or models of how to live their lives as men and they go back to the state so to the initial uh, uh, initial s state uh, before the intervention. So it's not only enough to work with the men to achieve the social change in the social norm around the uh, masculinity. We need to again work with all levels of the society. We need to work with men, women, communities, children, schools. Uh, youth workers, media, institution, and only then we can think of achieving the uh, change in the social norm around the around masculinity. Uh, personally, I worked with young men in Croatia and Bosnia, Serbia, Kosovo since 2006. And uh, I remember in 2007, we did a research where we asked them, what does it mean to be a man for you? And they said there are two ways of being a man. One is a negative one, which is like a macho guy that is violent, doesn't show emotions, uh, uses violence and is dominant over women. And then there is a positive way of being a man uh, where uh, that man is caring, doesn't use, emo doesn't use violence, uh, shows emotions and everything opposite to what I just said as a negative model. And what working with young men is, is, is going beyond that. So it's not replacing one myth by the other, but rather uh, getting young men to critically, uh, critically think and understand why it's important to change the model of masculinity. I'm always very sensitive, and this is what I kind of uh, remember, uh, remembered while I was listening to the previous speakers, where uh, I hear about funding sources for positive masculinity. I think that's a very wrong approach because instead of uh, transforming negative social norms, we are re just replacing one myth with the other and we are uh, coming from a normative position that there is this expectation of men that men need to fulfill instead of understanding the context and then really adapting the change to the local context by understanding the whole environment that, that this men, uh, these men uh, live in. Uh, I work in uh, Afghanistan, in DRC, uh, also uh, uh, in, uh, I work some, something in, uh, some work in the Sierra Leone on uh, peace building. And uh, for me, it's very also important to emphasize that uh, changing the social norms around masculinity is not only preventing gender-based violence, but it's creating a broader social change. Uh, the construct of masculinity comes in a package, so it's not only violence over women, but it's also resistance to change. It's also conservative, uh, I wouldn't say conservative, but rather uh, 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 aggressive uh, forms of political uh, uh, action. It's also uh, denying rights to 
others. So this is all a package of rigid patriarchal hegemonic uh, masculinity. So changing, transforming masculinity brings so much more of a change uh, rather than just uh, preventing violence. It's not just preventing violence. I'm just trying to emphasize the whole other aspects that uh, that are achieved by uh, transforming masculinity. So as a conclusion, uh, I would like to emphasize that we focus our work not to achieve positive masculinity, but rather to uh, critically reflect on all the uh, multi-dimensional ways that men live their lives and try to analyze what are the negative consequences of the same and to understand that uh, changing negative social norms around masculinity is not isolated, uh, uh, is not uh, solving one problem, but it's rather creating peace, creating stability, uh, healing the society and increasing uh, well-being of the community as a whole. Thank you, Natko. I think it was a really important presentation because there's a lot of discussion about working with men and boys and gender equality and very little discussion of how to do it and the practice on the ground. And I think to have that outlined, and I'm sure there'll be questions around that. I'm just going to take Chair's privilege. I'm also a senior fellow at Promundo. And one of the interesting things about the men care program that Natko mentioned for me was that actually a lot of that work came from women, grassroots women in women's organisations saying you need to work with the men. And I thought that was that's a really key thing for me with the men care program. Okay, thank you. Sinead, difficult job of... Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, I mean, I think there's a lot for us all to, to think about, but, but let me start, Natko, with, with a little bit on men's groups. I'm just struck, and I think maybe colleagues in the room and online who've, who've been in these sort of discussions for some years might also be struck by how long we've been talking about what a good idea it is to work with men and how little of it we still do. Um, I mean, Lisa will know in, in, in Sierra Leone there's, there's very little uh, work uh, happening um, and I'm sure in, in, in a lot of other countries as well. Um, and yet we all sit here and say, you know, it's so important, it's such a good idea. Um, and so I'm wondering why, why is there this, you know, disjuncture and you know, Shanila talked about, you know, well, maybe it's partly about we can't get funding because we're portraying men in, in these negative ways, which, which is interesting. I actually was, was asking around a little bit before this seminar. I, I spoke to a, a colleague, Emma Mulhern, who, who we worked in, in Sierra Leone on the teenage pregnancy work, and, and she was saying, well, you know, it's, it's very difficult to retain the balance between working with men and then not, you know, sort of still still focusing on kind of women and girls and keeping them sort of central, which a lot of organizations are trying to do. Um, and then I wrote to IRC, who've been working on men's groups in Sierra Leone and Liberia, and I asked them, and they, they sort of agreed. Um, and they said, you know, once you start programming, you know, with men, you know, sometimes they, they don't want to talk about things like gender-based violence, which was kind of why you wanted to talk to them in the first place. But then I'm kind of interested, Atko, in what you're saying, that actually maybe maybe that's approaching things in the wrong way and we need to be looking at a broader, longer term package. Uh, so I think, I mean, I think there's lots to think about, but, you know, maybe in the discussion, it would be interesting for, you know, to hear from, from people in the room or online, you know, have your organizations had, you know, maybe challenging experiences working with men or, or are you avoiding it for, for some reason? Is it that you can't get funding? Is it that you find the programming becomes a little unbalanced? So I'd be, I'd be interested to, to hear about that. Um, and, and secondly, I wanted to say that uh, I think in our, in our sector in general, we often avoid things, talking about things that make us feel uncomfortable, which I think is, is, is sort of quite counterproductive. Uh, uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about <laughs> a couple of those things, uh, as I think our, our panelists have already. Um, and, and really, I want to make a couple of points about uh, money. Um, Shanila, uh, you talked about how we homogenize girls in, in our programming in various ways. Um, and I would argue we also homogenize girls in, in maybe this sort of part of the vision that you talked about. Um, I think we also assume, you know, a sort of an innocence, right? 
you know, when we're sort of fundraising for these girls and we're trying to gain support for our programming, it's kind of useful if we sort of keep this this sort of picture that, you know, these are very innocent uh, girls. Um, and maybe that's why we're less comfortable talking about things like transactional sex that, that, um, that Lisa talked about, because maybe we think this, you know, sort of challenges that notion. But I can tell you from Sierra Leone, <laughs> you cannot get away from this. It is everywhere. It's sex for school fees. It's sex for soap, it's sex for food, it's sex for motorbike rides to school, and it's amazing how little we talk about it relative to how actually enormous it is in, in girls' lives. And, and we're not going to come up with, you know, effective programming if we don't actually face up to some of these, you know, sort of more, more kind of controversial issues. Um, and my second point about money is, is, is kind of relevant to that um, in the sense, I mean, I think everybody in this room will agree that a key, you know, maybe the key uh, to sort of uh, girls' and uh, women's empowerment in the long term is, is education. Um, I, I'm Irish. Uh, the difference between even my mother's experience and my own experience, my mother was a civil servant. She had to quit her job when she got married because that was... That was the way in those days until that was the rule. It wasn't just a, a custom. Uh, I'm a civil servant. It's laughable that I would have to quit my job when I got married. So that enormous difference in Ireland, I, I think it was fundamentally because of, of education. Um, and I think if, coming back to money, one of the best ways to convince communities, I would argue, in poor countries of the value of girls' education is for those girls to start sending cash back to the village. I think then people are like, oh, this is actually very interesting, this whole girls' education thing. Um, you know, it may seem a bit utilitarian, uh, but nevertheless. Um, and obviously that education has to be quality, uh, and, and I would argue it has to be formal. Um, and just coming back to the sort of innocence point again, uh, one of the things that we worked on in Sierra Leone was getting pregnant girls into the formal education system because they were banned. Um, and they were banned because they were seen that they would infect other girls, um, you know, innocent girls, right, with, um, with their sort of, uh, their, their kind of immorality. This was the, the, the arguments that were made. Um, and we, we, made, we made a lot of progress uh, post Ebola. We got 17,000 uh, pregnant girls into formal education. Very imperfect, lots still to do. But I think it was an important step uh, uh, when we did with, with the UK government as well and, and UNICEF and UNFPA. Um, but I think, and again, in our sector, we are a lot better with working with girls on preventing teenage pregnancy than we are with working with girls who are already pregnant or already have a kid. And, you know, for us, getting them into the formal education system and not sort of writing them off because, oh, well, we failed with you, so we'll just go back to our sort of innocent girls and keep trying to keep them there. Um, we, we need to recognize that just having one kid as a teenager doesn't mean you have to have two kids as a teenager. Um, and we don't write you off, you know, because you have become pregnant and you've maybe punctured a little bit our nice homogenized view um, of, of girls uh, who, who deserve, uh, quote unquote, to be, to be educated uh, formally. Um, so the, the, the last point maybe I, I want to make, and it's also sort of related to this, this issue uh, around innocence, and it's about access to contraception, and, and Lisa picked up on this. Um, you know, often we don't want to, you know, we kind of get uneasy when it comes to providing access to contraception to under 18s. And, you know, it's a little bit of a tricky area. And then we kind of say, well, you know, there's condoms in the clinics. We all know that a teenage girl in, you know, let's say the, the African countries where I'd be most familiar with, um, they're not going to want to go to the clinic for a condom. And there's their aunt and there's their, you know, teacher and there's their nosy neighbors. And so, again, maybe in the Q&A, it would be interesting uh, to hear from some of you on, on this how question, you know, how do you really reach girls with the contraception that they obviously need? Let's just, you know, face up to that. They do need it. So really the question is, how do we get it to them? And maybe some of you have had good or bad experiences uh, in trying to do that. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Elaine. Thank you. So I'm sure those really interesting presentations, there are going to be um, lots of questions. I'm going to take some from the floor first, but I'm also taking them from the online audience. If you could say your name and if you're with an organisation, say your organisation as well, that would be great. Rachel's going to come up um, 
and answer some questions as well because she's been working with Lisa and her other colleagues. So thank you. Welcome, Rachel. Nice to have you up here as well. Um, okay. Yes. 